You know, if there's one question I get asked more than any other, more even than why the hell was Schrodinger thinking about sticking a dead cat in a box in the first place, that question would have to be, Mark, is this Nikon 5cm f1.4 Leica thread mount rangefinder lens worthy of its reputation as a game-changing lens of the last century, or does its photographic pedigree just make it a dog with a fancy collar? Well, today we're going to try and answer that question. This is a famous lens. Once their most popular lens, it was a breakthrough performer that catapulted Nikon into the big league and made Japanese rangefinder lenses a hardcore alternative for those Korean War Leica photojournalists. According to Analog Law, it was popularized by war photographer David Douglas Duncan, pictured here with Pablo Picasso, who he famously shot over a 17-year friendship during the last years of Picasso's life. I mean, I mean shot, not shot, obviously. Duncan allegedly paired his Leica camera with Nikon lenses, finding them to be better performers and more contrasty, which made them great for black and white news photography, and supposedly had the editors of Life magazine thinking he was using a large format camera. This one is a successor to an f1.5 version that's quite rare, though I suspect it's a different optical formula. Duncan used both versions, apparently, and while later photographs of him posing with a Nikon Coolpix might betray him as something of a Nikon fanboy, this particular lens supposedly features strongly in the final chapter of his opus, This Is War, called Retreat Hell. Now, I don't claim to be any David Douglas Duncan, though retreat hell might be good advice before you settle in for this video. Don't expect portfolio shots here. Don't even expect a rigorous and objective review of the lens. But if you want to see what this lens can do, then strap on your M1 combat helmet, lace up your boots and come with me to the battle zones of Scarborough Beach and Hillary's Boat Harbour in Perth, Western Australia, as I shoot off a round of photos into the field with my Zorky 4K sharpshooter loaded with Ilford HP5 ammunition and the Nippon Kogaku 5cm f1.4 SC stuck on the muzzle. Set this one to 250th F11. Okay, this one is very much into the sun, so expect heaps of flare, and uh, we're going to stick with a thousandth of a second at F11.
sticking with 120, uh, 1 250th of a second at f8. thousandth of a second at F11. That's one one hundred and eightieth at F8. Do two hundred and fiftieth. One five hundredth at five point six. No David Duncan Douglas style epic war photography, though it can get a bit hectic as the soccer mums jostle for their skinny soy lattes at Scarborough Beach on a Sunday morning. And the thwack 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 of the surf life saving helicopters can't help but make me feel a little bit like I'm in the opening credits of MASH. Still, hopefully you get a sense of what this lens can do in these clumsy hands. I deliberately didn't pair it with a Nikon or Leica. I don't own a Nikon or Leica rangefinder. Instead, using it on this bastard half-brother of a Russian rangefinder, my trusty Zorki 4K, which isn't all that trusty, to be honest. I hadn't used it for a while because the rangefinder seemed way off. Even a local camera repair technician was convinced it was cactus, as it overshot the infinity mark by miles. In the end, the solution was actually quite simple. Uh, trying to mount one of my Canon lenses caused it to twist the rangefinder cam, and I know that because when I adjusted it back to the right position and put that lens on again, it bent it again. One pair of pliers and a dab of superglue though, and it seems fine for now. 
even if it does seem to be focusing a little bit closer than it tells me in the rangefinder. If you do want to see some more of my experiences with the Zorki, I'm including a link to a video where I discuss it here somewhere. These photos probably were not the best test of the lens since it was a sunny day and I pretty much shot all of these photos on Ilford HP5 at f11 and a 250th of a second. I know I should be using slower film, but it's winter in Perth and I thought I might need the speed of ISO 400. I did manage to take a couple of indoor and shady shots though. This should give you a sense of the bokeh. Generally, it's very smooth and while it can get a bit busy in the middle distance when wide open, there aren't really any examples here of note. One thing for sure, when doing normal photography, the lens is plenty sharp. But just how sharp? Let's do some rigorous empirical testing. Yes, I know I'm laughing on the inside too. For a start, no 60 year old lens is going to give you an objective idea about every version out there. While a Nikon was famous for its consistency in manufacturing, you still get some sample variation and even more so once each of those samples has lived a life. Time is a cruel mistress, just ask Melanie Griffith. This one was found neglected in a dusty cardboard box full of old lenses in a photo market. The aperture ring was a little wobbly and I've had that fixed. The lens cleaned up nicely though, other than one quite visible scratch on the rear element. Look, it may impact on image quality, but I've never really noticed it, um, even when I shot into the sun or stopped down, but I'm definitely not complaining either at the price I got it for. Of course, no lens is perfect. So let's just see how imperfect this lens is and what would be the point of a video like this if I didn't provide some basis for comparison. As if staring at test images taken at multiple apertures isn't exciting enough for you, I'm also introducing this humongous light bucket of a lens, the Sigma 50mm f1.4 EX DG HSM Nikon F-mount lens, a much more modern optic, though introduced before the art version, which does make sense because I certainly wouldn't call what I'm going to be doing today, which is random snapshots taken around campus as art, or maybe I will. So here I am at my favorite brick wall. It is a place of art, a place of engineering. It is the stony edifice of academia and a good opportunity to test a lens in terms of sharpness, vignetting and distortion. Now, this is probably going to be a little bit boring for you. It's certainly a little bit boring for me. But at the same time, I think it will give us a little bit of a sense of what this lens can do in the real world if the real world means taking pictures of walls. We have here my Nikon Z6, not the highest resolution camera in the world, but I think good enough for a 1950s lens. Five second timer. I've mounted the Nikon f1.4 lens through a what, M39 to Z adapter on the Nikon Z6. I focused on the hand on the left and that should allow us to capture the art as well as the rigorous intellectual debate made up of the writing on the drain pipe. And of course, two plus two is suck my penis. These words are obviously throwing down the gauntlet to challenge the axiomatic imperialism of mathematical logic and elevate arithmetic addition to a new plane of performance art. Questionable aesthetic merit, but it does at least show that the older rangefinder lens holds its own when stopped down. 
even if it can't really compete with the newer Sigma. But I know I have just whet your appetite for brick walls and don't worry, the main course is still to come. This time a bit more colorful and this time at an angle too because I like to usurp the planar horizontal hegemony. But more importantly, so we can see how the focus falls off. All right, I'm going to focus on the, it looks like a, a knot or part of a flower to the right of the girl's face. Using the Sigma and starting at f1.4 again. All right, and now once again, the whole palaver of having to remove the tripod plate because the FTZ adapter is the most clumsy accessory ever made. And for something that is essentially electrical contacts and air, it was a pretty dodgy design. They have fixed it now, version two, but I'm not gonna buy that because it's also an overpriced device made up of electrical contacts and air. Let's just give myself a black screen. And already I can see that the contrast just is not there, but let's go. Yeah, that contrast is just not there on the Nikon. I'm sure you've had enough of brick walls now. Let's immerse ourselves in nature. Now for this one, I think what I'm going to try and do is actually capture that one little piece of bad pruning. What are we up to now? Have 2.8. I'm going to check that again. Oh wow, that looks good. That looks really sharp. 5.6. F11. Hello. What are you doing? Uh, something nerdy. <laughs> Testing how sharp a 1958 lens is. Why, why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you do that? Oh, that's embarrassing. And this is what this channel is all about. I embarrass myself so you don't have to. You're welcome. This was actually quite an interesting test. You're really getting a sense of how the Nikon lens renders the out of focus areas with the highlights creating a cacophony of bokeh balls. Things do get a bit better as you stop it down, but then I think you lose something too. The Sigma lens is better straight out of the gate, being sharper where it counts and a lot smoother. So we know that the Sigma is definitely the superior lens by modern standards, though it's fascinating to see how well the old Nikon holds up once stopped down. And I think you'll agree that that test was a bit more interesting in terms of the rendering of the busy backgrounds but somehow, my thirst for walls isn't slaked yet. All right, let's see what a scrawly wall will give us in terms of sharpness. I'll be doing it at middle distance. I'll work out how far away I am and I'll soon let you know. Okay, so let's zoom in. There we go. All right, f1.4, looking very hazy again. This is approximately 15 feet. Yep, 15 feet, a little bit short of 15 feet, according to Nikon. This is a good example of where you probably wouldn't want to use this lens wide open. A picture like this relies on the formality of the geometry and the sharpness of the design. At f1.4, it's mush with lots of vignetting, 
sharper at f2, but for a picture like this, not really acceptable until f5.6, and it keeps getting sharper until about f11, though even then that could be the slower shutter speed impacting on the resolution of the final one with f16 betraying my complete inability to hold a camera, even with modern image stabilization. So this one is going to be an infinity test. We're going to be doing it at the full range again, starting at f1.4. We'll see where it takes us. I'm actually going to boost the ISO this time to 400 because I was at half a second with that last photo and that could easily have impacted on sharpness. So let's make it even 800 so that I know I'm going to be safe. I was hoping here to capture some chromatic aberration by shooting into the leaves, but that proved surprisingly elusive. You'll see that it's definitely there, but not very distracting, and the image just keeps getting sharper again when I stop it down. You could be forgiven for thinking that f16 is actually sharper than f11, but I don't think it is. Uh, where I focused on the branch, you can see that it's ever so slightly softer, but I think the deeper depth of field gives, or at least creates, a sense of overall crispier image. What was interesting was the nicely rendered background. In shade, you get some nice fall off as you get deeper into the frame. Now for a close up. And we'll take that photo. Ah, the capriciousness of nature. I actually like this photo with a bit of editing. I think this one is usable at f1.4. It's definitely stronger at f2, sharper, but I like the character of this picture wide open. f2 works for me as well. You get the sharpness, the more you stop down, but the vignetting disappears, the blur becomes bland, and the image just seems sterile. Yeah, I'm happy with f2 here. Time to change angles for another vertical shot. Focusing very much on the L in welcome. It actually can be quite tricky to focus because it's soft all over. And this one really doesn't work for me. Obviously, when you see text, you want it to be sharp, and this lens just doesn't deliver. You can get it really crisp by f8, but by then you've lost all the character. In particular, there's nothing to separate it from the background, and while it's quite a balanced image, it's a boring one to me. I could have taken that with a phone. All right, let's get really close up. Again, closest focusing distance. This one was a bit more successful. Getting close up, I possibly missed critical focus on the leaf a couple of times, but it's sharp enough again by f2. I'd long given up comparing it with the newer Sigma, but it's clear that in the right conditions, there's something painterly about how the Nikon lens renders colors and the muted tones work well. The background is definitely more important in this image. At f1.4, it's completely obliterated, and I want the text to be recognizable but not distracting, my favorite aperture being around f8. So that's the Nikon 5cm f1.4 LTM lens, and I love it. To try and describe its quality, I'm going to chuck up a quote from Carl Zeiss about the earlier f1.5 version that is parroted everywhere around the internet. But I can't find the original, so take that claim and attribution with the proverbial 65 milligrams of NACL. I don't know what the hell slightly rounded sharpness means, and not being aggressively sharp sounds like damning with faint praise. But I do get a sense of that 1930s Hollywood glow when the lens is shot at an open aperture. Honestly, I find it a bit much at f1.4 at times. But hey, people pay good money for Cinestill 800T and Black Promis filters to get the same effect on their nighttime neon-lit petrol station photography. 
I think a lot of the nature of the lens comes down to the sonar design that was prevalent at the time. This has seven elements in three groups, which usually isn't something I pay much attention to, but I think that the design defines the character of this lens, the f1.5 that came before it, and the Lights 50mm f1.5, which was its main competitor. 70s soft porn aesthetic wide open, but maintaining a sharpness underneath the milky exudate. This could perhaps be a great portrait lens for ugly people, hiding the lemon rind pores while still letting you see some of the clarity in the eyes. In any case, it's a beautiful and substantial piece of engineering. 275 grams of brass and glass. While it might not match the performance of the Sigma 50 millimeter in pure metrics, try fitting this in your pocket. Yes, it's a rangefinder lens and with rangefinders typically, they don't focus closer than one meter. This does and one of the reputed features of this lens is that it was calibrated to be its sharpest close up rather than at infinity. The fact that this can get to half a meter, it's great, though I do still find that I want to get closer sometimes. The beauty of adapting it to your mirrorless camera is that it, you're not constantly constrained by the rangefinder system and it's much easier to get critical focus with it um, through peaking and magnification. Put it on a rangefinder though, and you're going to battle at f1.4 on close subjects, as you can see when I tried to focus on the text here. I'm not sure if I moved slightly or it's my dodgy rangefinder repair, but most of my issues came from the Zorki rather than the lens. The lack of frame lines in the Zorki viewfinder meant I never really knew what was being excluded or included in the frame. I didn't crop the film photos so you could see what things looked like straight out of camera, but I did have a tendency to capture more than I intended to, and most of the images would have benefited from a tighter frame. Many of the photos, I think, worked better at a different aspect ratio too, particularly when you think that seascapes often lend themselves to much broader 16 by nine frames, for example, than six by four. For vertical shots, I find I tend to trim the long end simply because tall images generally just don't gel with me. When you're capturing fleeting moments, it's better to get all of it in anyway, having the ability to decide what to keep later. The ethics and aesthetics of cropping and editing street photographs is probably a topic for another video, but ultimately, if cropping is fine by Elliot Erwitt, then I'm okay with it too. At least, that's my excuse. As familiar as I am with a 50mm prime lens, I do find it limiting when out shooting random subjects. Too narrow to take in environments, too wide to hone in on detail, it sounds quite inflexible. But what you've seen today is that this is a lens that behaves very differently at different apertures. In a sense, what you have here is three lenses in one. At f1.4, it gives the whole image a soft, dreamy look, becoming much better behaved at f2 and 2.8, where you really get some sharpness, but still with some sweet separation from the out of focus areas. Stop it down further and it just seems to get even sharper. Even at f16, I didn't really notice too much diffraction compared to f11. You can see why this caused such a stir among war photographers looking for something to incisively document the harsh brutality of battle. And who would have thought it would make such an amazing wildlife lens? Four lenses in one. Of course, it all comes at a cost. There is a Contax Nikon S-mount version that's comparatively affordable, but that lacks the focusing helicoid that allows you to easily adapt it to modern systems, even the Leica M-mount. The LTM version is harder to find and much more expensive, I think, because of that. It might be the niftiest 50, but certainly not the thriftiest. And try saying that after a few beers. The Nikon 5cm is worthy of its reputation though, and maybe even its cost. It served time in the theatre of conflict back in the day, and today it's participated in the theatre of the absurd. Is it Meryl Streep or is it Madonna? I'll let you decide, but I know for sure 
that this Nikon 5cm f1.4 gets my Oscar vote and it's always performed well for me. It's a lens that will remain attached to my rangefinder at base camp, ready to be mobilized into photographic engagement at the first sound of alarm. Later.